A man is like a computer. He is programmed by heredity and environment. To the extent that he is creative, he is more than a computer. He is a form of life. But he is much slower. And he makes mistakes. If you're like, well, like a lot of people, the last year of work has looked a lot like this. Working hard on all the apps from regular emails to endless phone calls. And of course, a lot, but a lot of Zoom meetings. Hey, I think you're on mute. Most of us have wondered when we'll be able to go back to normal. Being able to actually talk to your coworkers in person? What a concept. But what if this is the new normal? What if that's the future of work? Oh, that sounds a little bit ominous for a pandemic, doesn't it? I don't think anybody needs any more depressive facts about pandemics and employment these days. But uh, let's keep going. Maybe it's not all bad. It's no secret that the gig economy has been growing steadily for the past decade at least. From local platforms like Uber or Lyft, to more global platforms where freelancers can trade all of their work online. And with a global pandemic going on? If one thing has become painfully obvious during the pandemic, it's that a lot of employers can rely on workforce who stays at home. And if they're not coming into the office anyway, then there's no real reason for them to even be in the same country, is there? And if they're not in the same country, well, then you have a bigger pool of labor, a potentially cheaper pool of labor, which might just be a few kilometers away. Crowd work, I think of it as a task you need to be done. You break it up into a little task, and then you get a bunch of people to do various bits, and then you put it together. So it, it works for some types of things, but not for other types of things. Richard Baldwin is a professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. He also wrote the book on technology and the future of work, and he paints a pretty interesting picture of what's about to happen. The ability of people to sit in one country and work in offices in the other is really the big trend. The focus of globalization in the past two and a half decades has been on manufacturing and farms, Offshoring outsourcing is an old story in manufacturing, but this is going to focus on offices. So that kind of online work affecting workers in offices is the key difference. That's, that's what the development is. The thing that makes that possible right now was the great divergence that happened between, say, 1820 and 1990, when per capita incomes around the world diverged from you know, something like two to one to something like 14, 15 to one quite, are quite common income differences. So you start with a world where, for example, an accountant, even quite a well-trained accountant sitting in the Philippines is earning one-tenth when an accountant sitting in New York is. And that opens up that opportunity. So that's the, the economic incentive to do this unbundling was created by the great divergence. Now, the capacity to exploit that difference is really all due to digital technology. And I would point to three things in particular. So the first is excellent audiovisual communication, exactly what we're doing now. You're creating a relatively high quality video recording of me, and we're not anywhere near close to each other. And it wouldn't actually matter whether you were in Japan or Geneva. The second is machine translation. And I think this is underappreciated right now, but you can see it's creeping into all sorts of things now. The language barrier is much less of a barrier than it was before. I'm going to give a talk in Vienna tomorrow, I mean virtually, and I got the email, the Zoom call was in German. And uh, I opened it up in Outlook and it offered to translate it for me. So I translated it. So now the fact that it came in German was no barrier to me, and that's going to break down a lot of barriers and open up a large supply and then the last one is collaborative software, which makes it easier to coordinate a team where some of the members are remote. Working, for instance, on a Google Word document where several people do it at the same time. So all the collaborative software makes it much easier for a remote team to work together. So those three technical things 
make it easier to arbitrage the wage differences that were created by the great convert divergence. Wait, so does this mean there won't be any jobs in developed countries? Everything is not fixed yet. But since the web makes everything international, regulations have to be, well, international. So you could go directly to the international organizations. That would be the logical next step. But the problem here is that it's really difficult to define what crowd work even is. The OECD, the European Parliament, the ILO, and even the WTO have some working definition of the issue. But so long as there are still debates about this, it can hardly be regulated. In 1998, the WTO put a moratorium on the issue of defining the digital economy. And every year since then, the debates have not come to a conclusion. Is crowd work a type of trade in goods, services, or is it something completely new? But this is also about the nature of work, labor standards, and just the future of people making a living. And while international organizations still have different opinions, countries, well, they know where we're headed. The U.S. with most crowd working companies has allowed them to trade freely. They use both foreign and local labor, who they consider to be independent contractors. China has taken a much more aggressive approach, trying to protect its own industry of crowd working and developing its own platforms. But the biggest economies are not the only ones in the game. See, the danger with crowd work is not just that jobs will go to the lowest bidder, but that the digital divide could deepen the divide that already exists between developed and developing nations. And some countries have realized they actually have a shot at benefiting from this economy. An unlikely example of this is Uruguay, a country that has introduced a slew of reforms to modernize the education system. That way, their workers are able to compete with crowd workers abroad. They've also invested heavily into the industry. Uruguayan platforms follow a model inspired by American firms. However, they also benefit from direct investment from the government, as well as heavy promotion from the same. So Uruguay is kind of playing catch-up and trying to become a major competitor in the new system. But with all these countries competing against each other, even if new jobs are created, simple supply and demand might be more important. Because if the ultimate goal is to be more competitive, we're pretty likely to see a race to the bottom. And then, well, then the ball is back in the national organization's court. 